From under the Golden Dome in Charleston, this is the West Virginia Capitol Report. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of the Capitol Report. I'm Bill Laird, along with co-host Dave Perry, and we have a very interesting, uh, great show lined up for you today. Very timely topic, and uh, uh, Dave, we're, we're joined by a very special guest here, uh, a gentleman uh, who is hard at work uh, uh, protecting the interests of the citizens of the great state of West Virginia, the Honorable 34th Attorney General of the great state of West Virginia, the Honorable Patrick Morrissey, uh, again, first elected as Attorney General of the state of West Virginia in the uh, 2012 uh, general election, took office in January 2013. And, uh, is currently in his second term as Attorney General of the state and uh, uh, pursuing his third term in that office. So, uh, uh, Mr. Attorney General, welcome to the Capitol Report Show. Well, it's great to be on the program today. We have a lot of ground to cover uh, because with COVID-19, there's just an endless supply of legal issues, uh, protecting consumers. There's just a lot, a lot we can talk about today. No doubt about it. And again, I uh, really appreciate you joining us. Uh, and we'll get right to it. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'll begin uh, again, uh, you know, a pandemic, uh, we see the, the very best of people and uh, sometimes uh, we can see the worst. Uh, and I know your office is, uh, you know, part of your assigned duties and responsibilities are protecting consumers, uh, the citizens of the state of West Virginia, and again, uh, uh, the possibility of scams, uh, you know, consumer fraud, uh, price gouging, uh, those things can occur in times uh, such as what we face uh, today. And, again, what can you tell us about, uh, about those concerns, uh, what your office may have been uh, uh, having to respond to in those uh, unfortunate instances where the worst comes out? Well, first of all, I want to thank both of you for giving me the opportunity to be with you today because these are really critical times. I think everyone is really struggling during this pandemic. We know a lot of people are hurting from a financial perspective. Uh, there are a lot of important health care issues pending. And we're trying to do our job in the AG's office very aggressively. I think West Virginians want to look to the office during this time to know that the Attorney General is doing everything possible to enforce the laws, to protect consumers, and also just to answer any questions that are out there. These are really difficult questions that none of us have ever dealt with in our entire life. And so it's important to make sure we're providing as much information as possible. So that's why being on the show today, I think, sends a message we can help people understand about consumer issues, about the law, about scams, and all sorts of things. On the price gouging front, that's probably the biggest complaint that we get into our office. We've received over 600 calls in recent weeks, and we have about five investigators that go out across the state you know, we investigate every allegation of wrongdoing. We've been monitoring the supply very carefully. What we've heard is that the shelves are getting restocked by and large, but there are some pricing issues coming up with eggs, with chicken, with beef, obviously toilet paper. We've all heard that story. Uh, but I want to emphasize that the West Virginia businesses and the consumers First of all, they should be praised. So many folks have come out, and the retail establishments that are open to feed our state, the truck drivers, the first responders, they're doing an amazing job. Now, we have heard of a couple bad apples along the way. From a price gouging perspective, we've sent out over a dozen cease and desist letters. We've sent subpoenas out because we're investigating every allegation of wrongdoing. And what we found is that, first of all, some people didn't know the nature of the law. For those watching, price gouging occurs when you hike the price of a good or service up over 10% during a state of emergency. You just can't do it during this time. Now, there are some exceptions to the rules. We've found some instances where suppliers were providing eggs or chicken or beef at an elevated price and they were passing it along to the grocer or to the retailer. So what we do is we try to find out exactly what happened before we prosecute folks. Now on price gouging, 
we're working with the U.S. Attorney in the Southern District and the Northern District, we created a task force because the Attorney General has broad civil authorities, but when you combine resources with the U.S. Attorney, that gets into some of the criminal issues as well. So this has been a good partnership. It also allows you to divide and conquer a little bit more because you have our investigators, but then when you combine it with the U.S. Attorney's Office, with the FBI, it can be a very powerful force. We're also hearing about a lot of scams out there, these utility scams. I think we've addressed a lot of those issues because we talked to the utilities weeks ago. They're not suspending service for people. So if you get someone calling you saying that th your power is about to go out, no, it's a scam. Right. Fight back. Call my office. Call 1-800-368-8808. We're here to help you. We have people working around the clock helping folks out. So again, that uh, 800 number, very important for our viewers. Uh, we'll go ahead and superimpose that on the bottom of the screen, ways in which to alert your office and request assistance on consumer fraud, uh, scam type uh, issues. And Senator, the other thing I would add is people can file electronically as well. They can go to wvago.gov and that's an easy way, something we instituted to make it easy for people. You bet. Patrick, uh, of course, the public needs to have a great deal of confidence in the Attorney General's office. Sure. And obviously, this is not the first time you've been involved in kind of a situation like no. this. I think at the federal level, you were involved with uh, anthrax planning and, and so forth. Could you discuss that a little bit for us? Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. I was thinking about this recently that back in 2002, we spent a lot of time. I was a senior staff member at the U.S. House Energy and Commerce Committee, and many people watching may remember 9-11. I certainly do. I was in the Capitol buildings when we expected uh, the fourth plane to come, mm -hmm. and it was really a very scary time. Well, after that happened, there were a lot of threats for bioterrorism, for anthrax, and so our committee was charged with putting together a bioterrorism and public health preparedness law, and I had the honor of being the lead staffer in the U.S. House of Representatives to help manage that conference. And we dealt with a lot of issues such as vaccine development, HHS emergency authority, uh, containment, hospital capacity, the healthcare infrastructure that gets created. And so it's really fascinating now, here we are 18 years later and we're living through our own experience. And this is something that no one's ever experienced uh, anyone on the globe right now. No one's ever gone through this before. Maybe people in the Spanish flu, back in 1918, but this is very different. And I'm glad we've had those experiences. I can apply those to all the working knowledge in the Attorney General's office to do everything I can to protect as many people as possible and make sure that all the decisions that are being made, at least at a state government level, are being done with the public health in mind, with the law in mind, and that, that experience, I think, has helped me a lot during this time. And you've issued a number of uh, opinions to the governor, to local counties, uh, to the uh, Secretary of State and so forth. Could you discuss some of those and the basis on which you made those decisions? Absolutely. So the Attorney General is the chief legal officer of the state and we're charged with getting things right. People usually ask us whether something's lawful or whether it's not lawful. And so these are difficult calls. What we did, we started back in early February looking a lot of the state's emergency authorities and then examining the state constitution, the federal constitution. And what we found is a lot of the case law goes back to the early 1900s mm. or after the Spanish flu. So we got into this very early because we knew that if this ended up being a big pandemic like it's proving to be, we had to be ready and we were ready. And so we started dispensing counsel to the governor, to state agencies, to the counties, to the prosecutors. And what this represents, uh, Dave, is a collision of constitutional rights. <laughs> the state has broad police power, of course, to protect the public health. And those who are following the governor know that every day he has the public health officer there. He has experts. He's trying to do good things that help protect West Virginians. It's my job to make sure that, yes, that has to continue, but we also have to protect constitutional rights as well. During this pandemic, your constitutional rights can't be eroded. Right. Due process is maintained. Your civil liberties are protected. And it's our job to look through all these declarations 
and make sure that the right thing is happening. And I think we've been able to be very helpful trying to strike that right balance. And uh, while there'll be a lot of litigation that probably occurs after this happens, I think I'm really proud of the work that our office has done to strike that right balance. Uh, again, Mr. Attorney General, the you know our response uh, you know to this pandemic uh, a crisis. It's to me, it's been almost a a lesson in uh, the principles of federalism. You yeah. know, we have layered responsibilities. We have a, a you know a federal uh, government that has uh, nationwide. I think all 50 states are under a uh, emergency declaration. That's right. Uh, but yet, uh, you know, the individual states being closer to the, the problem and uh, again, sort of the reserve uh, rights of the states to, uh, uh, to prescribe, you know, those uh, uh, methods by which they can better mitigate and try to, as they say, flatten the curve. Uh, uh, and again, local units of government with county health departments, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, every, the, the units of government all have, uh, you know, collective, though maybe perhaps not always cohesive uh, right. uh, layers of responsibility. And, and, and from your perspective, uh, you know, us as citizens sitting there uh, listening, getting messages from multiple sources, uh, uh, in your, your opinion as Attorney General, uh, you know, who should we be listening to? Uh, well, I, uh, I think it's a great question, and I think sometimes it's hard to know who you should turn to because so many people step up. But the beauty of our constitutional system is that you have uh, federal government, you have state government, you have local governments as well. And there's an important role for everyone to play during a crisis like this. I think people within a community still turn to their mayors. They turn to their governors. They turn to their local elected leaders. But also people look every day. We're seeing it on Fox News, people could go see the president every day talking about the nature of this pandemic. I think that the right answer is we need to be following our public health officials, we need to be listening to our elected leaders, and we need to make sure that we're engaging in the strategies to protect the public health. I think that's the most important piece, that when the governor comes on and he's relying on a lot of the public health officials, or you see uh, Fauci and you see uh, the folks over at HHS on the federal side, I think they're trying to provide good information to us. But then you also have the president coming on because he knows the importance of not only evaluating the public health side of this equation, but the economic piece and the types of relief that have to be provided to the American people. That's why I think you saw him take action with respect to the CARES Act, an unprecedented uh, effort on the part of Congress and the president to step up, provide relief, not only in unemployment, but a lot of those loans to businesses, the checks to individuals. So I think there's a role for everyone to play. And what people are seeing during this just challenging time is also that states really drive a lot of the process. You know that the governor uh, really is in charge of a lot of the state of emergency issues in West Virginia. Other executive officials set up the public health officers. Even our office plays an important role on enforcement and interpreting the law. So I think this is actually a beautiful work in progress in terms of how government works. It's pretty messy and it can yeah. look pretty nasty from time to time. But this is what the founders intended. There's a role for the feds. There's a role for state and local. And I think after this is all done, we need to have a broad national debate about what we learn from this and how we can do it even a little bit better in the future. Absolutely. And again, a, a contagious virus uh, knows no jurisdictional uh, or political boundaries. That's right. it's, uh, it's something that uh, uh, is, transcends all those, uh, all those divisions. Patrick, you recently issued an order to the Secretary of State regarding absentee voting, yeah. uh, where it could be broadened during a state of emergency. Uh, what opinions or principles involved in that were Absolutely. involved in that decision? Well, we've done a couple things recently. First, I think many people had concluded that the election date uh, was an issue because this was when West Virginia was expected to be at the peak in terms of the pandemic. So I know that the governor and the secretary of state were deeply worried about that. And we started looking at the law because we have to make sure that any changes that occur are done in a lawful manner. 
So we were able to do two things. One is I think many people know the election date has been moved to June 9th. And that was because we looked at the governor's authority in tandem with the secretary of state's authority. And we know that the net result of that action is going to cause more people to vote. That's important. I'm always fond of saying if you have an election and five people show up, that doesn't really help our system terribly much. Right. So I think what you're going to see is by moving the election date and by also expanding what can be included as an absentee ballot, this is going to help many more people get to the polls. Now, we also need to make sure that we're monitoring for voter integrity as well. There can't be any cheating in the system. And we know with some of the paper ballots, that can create some problems. But what we saw for the absentee ballot process is that there's always an exception for health care. And what is COVID-19? Well, that's a broad public health care issues. And one reason to go absentee is people don't want to go out in public and congregate. So that's why we thought we could expand that interpretation. I think it's going to mean good things for the citizens of our state. And I think it's critical that people get out to vote. It's June 9th. You can get out, hopefully by then, we're going to be on the other side of this difficulty. Right. No one can predict the exact date. But also, people can avail themselves of the absentee ballot applications as well. I know that Senator Laird and myself spent years in the legislature. Yeah. And I found it interesting that it, legislative action wasn't required. Well, I think what you see is the legislature actually provided the governor and the secretary of state with broad authorities during a state of emergency. And I think after this pandemic concludes, there's going to be a pretty robust debate by the legislature mm. about what should be included in the governor's power and the executive branch's emergency power and what should not be, what warrants bring people back into session. But every action that the secretary of state and I'd say virtually all from the governor and the counties, they're actually doing it based on authority given to them by the legislature. Now, it's true that many of those decisions were made a very, very long time <laughs> ago. And so I think it's worthy of having a good debate and discussion about this because ultimately it's critical that the public has input in what kind of authorities their elected officials possess. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And again, uh, I'm sure there'll be uh, after action reviews as we uh, try to perfect these processes going forward. We're going to have to go ahead and take a quick break and be right back with the Honorable 34th Attorney General of the great state of West Virginia, the Honorable Patrick Morrissey. So we'll take a break and be right back. Stay with us, everybody. Stay tuned. The West Virginia Capital Report will be right back. The West Virginia Capital Report is brought to you by the AFL-CIO of West Virginia, Cucumber & Company, online at cucumberandcompany.com, and Mark Hunt & Associates, toll-free at 800-554-1280. From under the Golden Dome in Charleston, this is the West Virginia Capital Report. Welcome back to the Capital Report as we continue our discussion with the Attorney General of the State of West Virginia, the Honorable Patrick Morrissey. Uh, 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 Attorney General, uh, again, uh, uh, lots of consequences uh, as a result of uh, this public health crisis, but. Uh, uh, in, I guess, preparation for uh, what some were saying, the potential surge uh, yeah. when uh, cases may peak in West Virginia, a lot of our uh, local hospitals uh, around the state uh, began to ratchet back their uh, elective sure. procedures, and uh, which really go right to the heart of the revenue base that uh, make these uh, uh, important institutions financially viable. and. Uh, uh, as a result of this, I'd hate to think that some of the collateral consequences right. of a pandemic could be the weakening of our overall health care system in West Virginia. And I know uh, uh, you're concerned about those important issues. Uh, uh, from your perspective, uh, is it possible that uh, this could uh, uh, result in, you know, some, some hospitals uh, that are, you know, very fragile right now? Uh, you know, could this tip the scale? Well, I think when we're dealing with a pandemic, it's so important that we do everything we can to protect our vulnerable in our society. And so what we've seen here is that 
as there was an effort to bend the curve, there was a lot of focus on expanding capacity. That's part of the reason why you saw the governor put forth that ban on the elective procedures, because a lot of people were very worried that the hospital system, from a capacity perspective, could just get overrun. And I'm hopeful, like a lot of people are hopeful now, that that curve is being bent and West Virginia is doing a little bit better, at least in comparison to many other states, that it won't be long now because before we can start to modify some of those pieces. Hospitals have borne the brunt financially of this terrible crisis, and they've really hurt. I've talked to some of the hospital administrators, and these guys, I tell you, they're doing everything imaginable because they want to protect their workers. They want to retain as many employees as possible. But what do you do when such a large percentage of your revenue goes away? So one of the things that I think is really critical is that with the governor, myself, many other people, we have to have a real aggressive plan, not only to get people back to work, but to really make sure we're helping the entities that were on the front line of this terrible crisis. And that means the hospitals. It means the public health infrastructure of our state. When I've spoken to the U.S. Surgeon General, HHS, we were on a call last week with the president, we've talked about a lot of the critical issues to make sure that there is a stronger public health infrastructure afterwards and that consumers, citizens can know that they're going to still have that local hospital, they're going to have that community health center, they're going to have that federally qualified health center available to them. But that's going to take resources and we're all going to have to work in and really prioritize because no one really was at fault here. Right. This is a terrible epidemic. A lot of people are hurting. A lot of businesses are really bleeding right now. We have to make sure we step and do what it takes mm -hmm. to make sure that people are protected in the future and that people also get back to work very, very soon. You bet. Patrick, there were certain advocacy groups have suggested the possible release of inmates and prisoners held in our regional jails uh, and state correction facilities uh, due to the possible increase of exposure. Uh, what's your thoughts about this sure. suggestion? Well, we know that there have been a couple groups, and these are pretty out there groups, unfortunately, that are working hard. Originally, they were trying to free many, many prisoners. And I think that disturbed a lot of people uh, because this is not the time to kind of set off general panic right. among the population. Now, the biggest question I think we have to deal with is no one wants to see anyone get COVID-19, and that includes people that are in the prisoners prisons as well. So the best thing to do is to make sure that corrections is working together, that they have a plan, and that parole board is also working in tandem so that the right decisions get made. No one, but your attorney general does not want to release <laughs> anyone who should not be released into the general population uh, that's not warranted. You have to make sure that we're trusting the people within the corrections. At least as of today, based upon my information, not one person in the prison system has actually been affected by COVID-19. Now, uh, we're hopeful that will continue to be the case, although we know with the nature of this virus, it can affect anywhere. Mm -hmm. The key thing is let's take the steps to make sure that we're protecting everyone within our correctional facilities, our policemen, the guards, the folks in the regional jails, and the prisoners as well. The wrong policy would be to let rapists go, to let um, violent offenders go. And I know in some of the early versions, that's what I think could have happened. So that worries me as the attorney general, but we weigh in and we try to block that from happening. The best thing to do is to make sure that this is managed the right way at corrections and with the governor and other forces. And I'm confident that will happen. Yeah. So uh, tell us a little bit about your campaign and the issues that you feel are most important uh, and why the citizens of the state should be, should be elected you to a third term. Absolutely. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you for having me on the program today because we're covering a lot of really critical issues that matter for the citizens of our state. And the fact is, the best thing I could do right now as Attorney General, and even to the extent as I'm pursuing a third term, I just have to do my job. The last thing I've been focusing on is getting out on the campaign trail. We've actually been locked in issuing one legal opinion after another. Uh, we're enforcing our laws. We're trying to make sure people know there's a really strong professional operation in place that's working to protect people. 
this is critical. So we talked earlier in the show about price gouging and enforcing the laws. You need an attorney general who's going to enforce the laws regardless of political affiliation or economic status. I think that people could see, I'm finishing up my second term, all the actions we've taken have always been consistent with the law. And I've been very fortunate, especially during my second term, to work closely with President Trump. Mm -hmm. I think one of the big differences that people are going to see when we eventually get to the fall campaign is where folks stand with the president. I think that's important because I want to work with this president to put people back to work, especially after this pandemic. That's really critical. We also have to make sure that we're tackling the substance abuse epidemic with everything we have. I don't want to turn that over to inexperienced people that don't know how to manage this situation. It's so critical that we go after the root causes of this epidemic. That means going after it from a supply, a demand, and an educational perspective. And I think if people look to the things we've done in the AG's office, they'll see we've done it right. The prescribing in West Virginia of these illicit pills, down 51% since I took over. That's a pretty big deal. The education work is up dramatically. Many people may not realize this, but there was no substance abuse fighting unit when I took over the office. It didn't exist. Sure, you'd hire outside counsel, you'd engage in litigation, but we've taken it to a whole new level. Again, on behalf of uh, co-host Dave Perry, I'm Bill Laird, thanking you all for tuning us in each week on the West Virginia Capital Report. This has been the West Virginia Capital Report.